Thank you everyone for coming and uh, listening to my talk. I'm going to talk about a bit about how to do long-term maintenance for embedded Linux system. And by long-term, I mean something like 10 years or more. Um, so you understand a bit more where I come from. I say a bit uh, about myself. I've been doing Linux for about 20 years, first as a user, of course. And then in 2008, I started as a freelancer by OpenMoco. Um, OpenMoco uh, is a company who built a Linux-based phone. And yeah, uh, that didn't turn out uh, like Android or iPhone or something like that, but uh, it was very interesting and I learned many things there. And I also used Open Embedded for that. And since then, I've worked at uh, a company who builds GSM networks for cruise ships. Uh, at first, I thought this it was really interesting because I could spend my vacations there, but in the end it turned out that, that the, the software I deployed there over satellite links, it didn't fail, so I didn't need to go there to debug it. It was a bit sad, but uh, nevertheless, it worked out well. And uh, now since four years, I work at Pegotronics. We do embedded Linux systems for customers in Germany and Europe and so on in many different areas of uh, markets and so on. So to get a bit of impression of the audience here, please raise your hands. Who of you has developed uh, embedded Linux systems? Uh, about 90%. And who of those has systems who are now in the field? Uh, maybe half? Longer than five years, the same system in the field? 20, 10 years? Hmm, two people? So it is a small niche. Yeah. Um, of those three people, who runs a software, a kernel version, a glibc, and so on, on those systems? All of those which are still maintained by up to upstream. No one. So that's what I uh, feared. But yeah, we, we can't do this anymore because uh, yeah, those people probably had to fix vulnerabilities. But uh, I don't need to ask this question anymore because they probably didn't fix those vulnerabilities. It didn't take a day or a week or a month, maybe at the most, what would be acceptable. But it didn't even happen. So uh, some context about what's following in, in the uh, rest of the presentation. So our recommendations and observations are based on smaller development teams, like our customers, like our own teams. By small, I mean less than uh, 10 people working on the kernel and on the platform. Larger teams work a bit differently. Some of these things which uh, are going to follow may apply there as well, but not necessarily uh, identically. So most of our customers have custom hardware. They don't run simply on PCs. So you need to have some customizations at the lowest level of the system. And those move away from the mainstream server distributions like Debian, Red Hat, and so on. So you need to maintain those customizations. And in most of our customers, they don't just build one product and sell it for 15 years. No, they update the product every few years and have many products in the field which need to be maintained and supported. So those are lessons learned in the last 15 years uh, at Pycontronics, where we've mostly focused on doing development mainline based. So having as little as possible difference between the product that is shipped and what is uh, in the mainline kernel and the other upstream projects which are used on those embedded systems. So if you have any questions when, when something is unclear, just raise your hand. Uh, I think we'll have enough time for discussion later. Um, yeah. So yeah, a traditional uh, I would say, about the system's life cycle, which we've seen by, uh, at many of our customers, is that you just 
take a kernel, you get that from your vendor, or you take mainline, if it's a SOC that is well supported. You would take your build system, you add some user space software, you customize that, you add your application, and that boosts on testing, and you're done. That was, uh, that's what most people hope. But what then happens is they have a maintenance phase of 15 years, and they hope they have no platform changes. Maybe they think about they want to update their own application because they want to add new features, have some regulatory changes they need to um, apply to the existing products so they have a plan to update their application, but they usually have, don't have a plan to update the base system. And that's necessary. Um, those are some statistics from the uh, CVE, the Vulnerability Database, for some important projects which are probably in all of the, your embedded systems. So yeah, I, I won't go over all of them, obviously, but the takeaway is that you have about 100 CVEs in those central components per year. Obviously, not all of them are remote code execution, but many of those which are classed as denial of service actually are critical for embedded systems. Because if you ca remotely can crash the kernel, your product doesn't work anymore. Maybe it performs some critical function. So it's a critical bug for you. And those denial of services are much more prevalent than remote code execution. And we've also recently seen those very large denial of service, denial of service attacks, which happened in the last few weeks, originated from digital video recorders, security cameras, and so on. So all Linux-based embedded devices, which haven't been updated in years and are vulnerable to yeah, automated exploitation. So people can get hundreds, millions of those devices to, to perform yeah, denial of service attacks. But it's not always those uh, unintentional errors which also happen in the mainline kernel, obviously, and need to be fixed. But uh, in vendor kernels, which have never been through the mainline kernel main, mainlining process, so there has, no, no, has been no review, um, there happen things like uh, this backdoor, which was found in the all winner kernel. So all winner posted their source code on GitHub, and people built systems with that source but they never really looked at what all when are changed in those systems. And in the default configuration, you had a file in the proc file system. We just wrote this root my device string into it, and your process got changed to root. And that was not found in about one to two years, and it was all there in products. So what I want to... Uh, emphasize with this is that you cannot trust that your vendor will do the correct thing. Because there has been no one else except maybe one or two engineers who changed this that has looked at this code. And that would never happen uh, if this patch was posted on a Linux kernel mailing list. People would notice that this is not acceptable. So be wary of what your vendor gives you in your uh, enablement BSPs or demo BSPs. Don't just use it for products. Yeah, some observations which we have seen in customer projects. Yeah, as I said, hardware vendors don't care sec about security, but they also don't care about maintenance. Usually, they design a new SOC. They develop the Linux software for that because they need to have some sort of Linux support to sell those chips. But as soon as the uh, Linux support is far along to say that all the hardware in the SOC works, and that is shown by the vendor, the interest drops, drops rapidly. So maybe you get another update after one, two years to a newer kernel version. But even then, they usually take years from the point where they start developing on some fixed version to the point where they declare it stable. And but by then, it's already obsolete, more or less. So if you then start to develop on that base, 
at your own patches, maybe half a year, a year, then it's even more obsolete. Then some customers thought, yeah, I use Red Hat, I use Debian for the base system, add some customizations that can work for some, some things, especially if it's based on x86. But those projects don't have the established workflows to maintain a uh, difference based on those server distributions. So you know, each of those projects is basically on their own to build infrastructure to keep those changes in sync and to update to, to uh, newer Debian releases and so on. Um, then what we also often see, and what's also been discussed uh, on the long-term stable kernel initiative list uh, before the last kernel summit, is that yeah, we, we have these long-term stable kernels or the stable kernels released by Greg Cora Hartman and others. And embedded developers usually select one of those to build their product on, but after it's released, they don't follow this stable release chain anymore. So they, they think they select a stable kernel, and that's some benefit, but they don't actually apply those security patches, which will be released based on that stable kernel. So you basically get the, of, uh, the, the, the worst of both worlds. You get an absolute kernel when you start, and you don't get security patches either. So you're one of the only people who have selected those kernels. You don't get the benefit of testing by many people. So that will fail as well. Then even those people who have found that they need to update are afraid of it because they don't have a process to test that their product still works if they have updated the kernel or updated the glibc. So they are afraid or they, they can't justify the amount of work they need to put in to update this system. So they don't. And we have systems running two, six kernels uh, in the field. And we've also seen this uh, happening more often now that vendors basically uh, read about their device in the news and it's usually not good news. So, yeah. But then your reputation is probably damaged for years to come. So, yeah. Well, it's all, all down to that we need to do continuous maintenance. Because we have critical vulnerabilities which we need to fix. Usually one per uh, to two per system, which actually are critical to that product, because many don't apply, because we don't have certain configuration, maybe we don't use those network protocols which are affected and so on, so they don't all apply, but still some are left and we need to handle them. Also, most upstream projects, like the Linux kernel, like uh, OpenSSL, like the glibc and so on, they have maintenance releases, yes, but they only maintain those for two to five years, which is not enough for those 10 to 15 years which we need in those projects. So we need to move to newer versions, to new, newer stable releases. Um, again, the pre-built distros, they mean Red Hat and so on, those are not built for the kind of systems we need to have, like we heard in the last talk, which need to be updated without any intervention. They need to keep running for years. There is no admin that will regularly log in into that system and check if everything is all right and fix things if things are broken. So that their focus is simply different than what we need here. So we need to continually follow the uh, newer versions. So what some, what some people suggest we do is backporting. So we select some kernel, we test it, and it works for us. And then we monitor what happens upstream. So maybe they have new features, maybe they have some security fix, and so on. And in the beginning, um, it's easy. We can apply those changes uh, to our older kernel, get the fixes, and everything looks all right. But what happens in practice is that after some time, 
you're no longer in the maintenance window of upstream uh, pro uh, projects, so they don't tell you if your product is, uh, if the version you use is actually affected by this bug. You need to figure that out by yourself. And at that point, it becomes much more difficult to find out if a fix is really relevant to you. And you pile up patches and changes. These backports accumulate on your uh, kernel, on your glibc, and so on. And you have to maintain those, because you have done it yourself. Nobody else is using those patches. These backports have been done by yourself, so nobody else has tested them. So all the benefit you actually get from using uh, open source software, that other people are using the exactly same software and have tested this software, is completely lost. So for all bugs you find, you are on your own. So yeah, that's unsustainable. So yeah. let's take a step back. What do we actually want for those systems? Yeah, we want to have from the moment we notice that we need to do something, we need to be able to apply the fix and get it out to all the devices in a rather short time. So I'm talking about yeah, probably a week or hopefully less, maybe more, but not months. Because the time from announcement of uh, such a vulnerability to automated exploitation is getting shorter. So, yeah, should be as short as possible. Obviously, we don't want to break things when we deploy fixes. Maybe the fix is invasive and it could break things, but we need to be able to test that it doesn't break our application. And obviously, as small as our teams are, we need to have enough resources to do that. So it shouldn't be too much work, and it should be predictable, so we know for months and years and in advance how much time we need to invest. And when we have multiple projects, we don't to, uh, want to do this work for uh, each project individually. We want to share the work. Otherwise, after 10 years, if I release a product every two years, I have five products, and if I have five times the work, I can't handle that anymore. And obviously, um, the upstream communities are not lazy either. They develop new features, and that might be interesting for us because we can ship new features to existing products. It keeps our customers happy. So from the projects we've done with our customers, um, and what have you seen, what doesn't work? Basically, only one approach remains, which is that we always need to stay on releases maintained by the upstream process because we don't have the manpower to do it ourselves, so we need to rely on the community and do this work together by using those current stable releases by upstream. And don't get, uh, we don't want to have a large delta against the upstream projects. What you obviously can do and should do is disable features which you don't need because if those are affected by some vulnerability, you're not, and you can skip those updates. And the kernel now has lots of new hardening features which reduce the impact of those vulnerabilities, and you should enable them. Review security announcements regularly. That can be planned, maybe one day every week or something, depending on how large your project is. And you can plan time for that. And it's not too much work. There are communities who do that, the CVE community. You can subscribe to mailing lists. You get updates on that. If your system is current enough that you can simply use those announcements, it's not too much work. And for everything you do on your system, have processes which are well tested during the development, which are proven in maybe uh, older products, especially for building your software, so you, that you always know what software is running on the system. If you don't know what's running out there, you can't fix it anyway. So you need to be sure that you can build all the identical software, apply a fix, and ship that fix. You want to have automated testing, because if you keep repeatedly updating your system, you don't want to do that manually, so automate. 
and you want to do automated deployment, but because everything you do manually just takes time and uh, yeah, will go wrong from time to time. Yeah, I said that already. E each software release should define the complete system down to the last bit. That doesn't always work, but that's the goal uh, we should uh, head to. Because then we know yeah, if some vulnerability affects us. And ensure that we can update everything in the field because if we maybe don't, uh, are not able to update the kernel or are not able to update the bootloader and we do some verify boot and find that we have a problem in the bootloader and we can't update it, then we're screwed anyway. And it's not that difficult. But that's something you need to do uh, at the beginning. So that's my yeah, suggestion how such a workflow should look. And we've done this with cu customers, and that works. So the, the b basic changes for most customers are during the development phase, not during the maintenance phase. Because in this uh, time frame, you would basically lay the groundwork that the rest of the process will work. Other people have said this, uh, I said again, submit your changes to, to the kernel mainline. Um, on most SOCs, which are not deployed in mobile phones because they have lifetimes of two years or so anyway, the long-term systems are by now well supported in mainline. Most systems which don't use 3D graphics can run with very, very few patches. And only those changes, that is the part that you need to maintain, update, verify on every update. And you're going to do many updates. So reducing that amount is basically the key to having the rest of the process work. Automate the processes. It's, it's easy enough with continuous integration like Jenkins, automated testing, and so on. Do that during development so that you know that it works and you're familiar with it. Run that for as much as possible to, to get, yeah, to prove that it works for you. And don't choose a stable kernel when you start developing. Choose the most recent Linux kernel Git, base your stuff on that, and target a stable kernel only when you go into testing and up to the product release. Because then you basically save one update cycle and you're current at that point. That means you don't have to spend that work just immediately after product release to just get onto the current state. So our suggestion is, yeah, I say every, every year, seems to be a reasonable time frame, to update all software in your system, kernel, build system, user space, glibc, open SSL, and so on, to a version that is supported by the upstream projects for the rest of the year. Because otherwise, you have some time frame where you are on your own. So update your system, do it once per year. Look if you have some unfinished patches, which may be possible to get upstream at that point, because the kernel has evolved, the subsystems are, have improved, so you can get your remaining changes up the, uh, upstream. And run your automated test suite so that you don't have any regressions. And maybe yeah, improve the test suite if you find some. Just um, updating at that point doesn't mean that you need to deploy that system. Maybe over the year you haven't had any security vulnerability that affected your customers and you don't see any during updating. So you can decide to just put that in your shelf and have it ready for the uh, possibility that you need to update. So more often you need to check that um, your system is still secure. Look at the release announcements from upstream projects. Maybe do smaller updates if they release a stable kernel fix and so on integrate and let your automated test system test that so that you always know 
that your source code, your BSP, and so on, is in a state that works. And if you see some security announcement, look at it, check if it actually affects you, and then you can decide if you need to do uh, an incident response, so if you need to do the, uh, the fix in the field, but then that step is easy. It's just a small patch, you add it to your BSP, build again, test again, and click on the deploy button. Because you've tested that this pipeline works so many times during development, that's not different during, uh, during production than during development. Yeah, this is just some tools we have used or could use for some of those parts. Um, yeah, um, so just some words for each of them. Yeah, Jenkins 2 ha has updated uh, Jenkins with a yeah, new workflow, which makes it much easier to do yeah, system integration in Jenkins. You should have a look at it. it yeah, maybe it takes a week or so to get acquainted with that, and it helps a lot. It seems to be the standard system for, for doing continuous integration. And yeah, basically, that's key to software quality. Test automation. There's a nice project by uh, the Linaro people called Lava. I think it stands for Linaro Automated Validation Architecture, which is basically uh, web controllable server, which connects to all your boards and can run tests on them. So you need to connect those boards to some power switch, to serial to LAN converter, and some other things, optionally. And then Lava can deploy images on that, Jenkins, test them, run your uh, integration tests, can run your unit tests on those systems, and automatically t tell you overnight if something broke or if your fix R uh, is correct. Yeah, like we heard in the uh, last talk for updating, we want to have redundant boot so we can switch between two systems, fall back if we find some problem in the field we haven't seen in testing. That can always happen, so we need to have a way back. Can, can do that with many bootloaders, uh, with Bearbox. Uh, there, there's an integrated system which has some algorithms to decide basically when the system is good and when it has failed, it's customizable. Can do similar things with Uboot and Grub through, through script, scripting. You can use UEFI. They have a boot order defined uh, over those variables. It's possible on all uh, current PCs and also on ARM64, at least on the server systems. Then there are many, many projects. Uh, I think we also have talks about those in the next few days about software updates and recovery. Here are some, just some of them which I've looked at. Just choose one of them. Uh, that should be enough to get that process working. And in, in addition to the installation on the system, you want to have some system centrally which updates all your systems. So you can th do things like uh, Google does with their deployments. You, at the beginning, you push an update only to 10 systems, check if those all come back and work fine, then 100, then 1,000. So if something has slipped through testing, you don't break all your customers' devices at the same time. And those systems do that automatically. You can also do something custom, depends on your requirements. Yeah, so in summary, um, we've seen many approaches fail. Yeah, we can't ignore it. People do, but that will bite us. Ad hoc fixes for outdated systems work once, twice, but not for 10 or 15 years it's because it becomes an unmaintainable mess. Um, we can customize server distributions, but yeah, it's, it's always custom and not something uh, yeah, you can replicate easily. So, and I hope I've convinced you that if you do it right and 
plan from the beginning to do, have a, such a pro process and plan time for the regular updates. It's not that much work. Do the upstreaming, automate your processes, and develop a sustainable workflow that some people are scheduled to do that work every month, every year, have time for that. And um, yeah, I think we don't have any excuses uh, for leaving systems in the field with outdated software that's broken for years. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Um, I hope I have inspired some of you and maybe some questions or challenges. Yeah. So the, the first part of the question was um, how to work with uh, application teams that have problems with the platform changing under them. So, yeah, Basi my, my response to that is that Linux is our hardware abstraction layer and platform. So when you develop at the beginning, choose um, APIs like GStreamer, OpenGL, and so on, which are already stable, which are well-supported, and won't change significantly suddenly and get involved with those projects. So you can push back if you have uh, deployed products on those APIs and say, people, you can't sh change that under me. I depend on that. Those projects will listen to you. And those features, APIs, and platforms will keep working. Maybe they will tell you, yeah, you need to invest some time, but that's, yeah, that's a basically reasonable amount of work. And the other question, if I understood that right, is that some hardware vendors don't provide yeah, software releases based on current maintained releases. Yeah, that's true. Um, but I would say you don't want to trust them either, uh, anyway. So we ha had that for, for, for one customer who said, uh, I go with the uh, Freescale IMX6. Uh, I think Freescale has a 4.1 BSP release. Yeah, OK, that Freescale probably has done enough testing that would work somehow. And then they went and decided on a Wi-Fi module. And the Wi-Fi module window said, OK, we have tested this software with 3.8. So now what, you, what do you do? One vendor says, I only support you on 3.8. The other says, I only support you on 4.1. And you're screwed. So then you need to decide. Um, you can do some back porting, forward porting, or you get the stuff mainline. Then you get the testing from other people. You can work together with other people, find the same bugs. Those other people will find bugs in your work before they affect your customers. So get that stuff mainline. It's not that much work, especially if you build a project on something like the iMix 6. If you don't have uh, graphics, it's getting easier as well. You don't have that many changes you need to do. All the basic stuff works. And if it's just a Wi-Fi module, then you have one specific part of the, your system that you need to port mainline. You can do that yourself. You can hire a, uh, a consultant. That, that, that's the only way something like this will work. Otherwise, you, you're basically stuck on that version for 10 to 15 years. And you know that w it will be outdated. And it's only getting harder to update. So yeah, it's just, at that point, you can decide if, if you want to have something you can fix or if you don't need it. More questions? Uh, 
uh, the super long-term support by whom? I don't know if I know about that exact, uh, especially, but uh, there, there's the, the LTSI initiative by the Linux Foundation, which is, I think, yeah. I think um, if you're interested in that, read the discussion on the kernel summit mailing list for that topic. Yeah, so I think uh, Gregor Hartmann in his mail uh, on that list uh, said it best because one thing what, what happens is people choose one of those kernels and then don't update. Uh, as I said, you, you get the worst of both worlds. And it seems what the, the intention is good, that you work together, have some stable base, update some required features by all your partners, but it seems what actually happens is that there's not enough manpower, so that they are not able to keep up with their release schedule. And basically, we have again what happened uh, with the Linux kernel in 2.4 and 2.6, where we had uh, distributions running 2.4, because that was a stable kernel. They modified it, and it got worse and worse, and they were not able to update, uh, to, to maintain it anymore. And there was a hard break when switching to the uh, 2.6. And we also have it for Android, where we have a large fork with many, many changes. And they have large problems with maintaining that as well. So I'm not too hopeful that this will solve this problem. So at least for, for systems where you can use mainline, and I think that are most of them, that is the more promising approach, because you basically use the larger community, which runs Linux on all of the systems, and not some specific co uh, community which cannot keep up with testing, testing that all and maintaining it all. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a complete solution, but yeah. <laughs> So, so the question is, uh, how much work is it actually? Um, yeah. Um, I w I, let me go back to those slides. So every year, updating such a system. If you don't have too much changes in your system, have standard open source components, maybe your application based on Qt, on GStreamer, in Python and so on. So not too much low-level customization like those mobile phone vendors do. Um, then I would expect that every year you need to do some, something like two to four weeks. The main effort is testing. That's why I said automate that testing. So yeah, two to four weeks, I would guess. Yeah, it depends on how well your automated tests work. And then every month, I would say something like three to five days spread over the month, looking at that stuff. But that, that easily scales with uh, multiple projects if they all use the same base. And yeah, you can do that with something like uh, Yocto. You have different layers. They can all run the same kernel, run the same base layers have just some customizations, and then all the testing effort you spend on one system also improves the quality of the other systems. So yeah, a week maybe per month. Yeah, incident response depends on what actually happens, but ideally, if it's just another uh, OpenSSL release or something like that, it's probably less than a day. Apply to your BSPs, let the tests run overnight, and yeah, it shouldn't break anything at that level, and then you can release it. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, the comment was on uh, that this will only work on well-supported CPU architectures. Um, and, yeah, and that's right. So my suggest suggestion uh, in that way is that you should look at what is supported well now, because people will not throw out SOCs like uh, IMX or OMAP and so on out of the Linux kernel, because so many people use them and maintain them, so they will keep working. And yeah, we had systems which were, uh, where people said, hey, this architecture is not in use by anyone anymore, let's remove it, and some were removed, but you can uh, bring those back by reverting that commit, and if someone is interested in maintaining those architectures, uh, nobody in mainline is going to stop you. So if you're the last one uh, in this uh, community which actually uses that hardware, yeah, you're, you're stuck with maintaining that by yourself, but at least you can get review and um, comments on your fixes for free from, uh, from the mailing lists, which you don't get if you just do it for yourself. And those people will find fixes or bugs in the patches you submit, even if they work for your use case. Yeah, the, the question was, um, how do we convince the, the managers and customers, and maybe non-technical people? Yeah, I, I would say, in the long run, this is cheaper. Um, yeah, that's my opinion, they would, will say, but um, we've seen it in the Linux community many, many times. And this pattern is repeating in people who do, do the maintenance. It's, it's not too much work. Um, for some customers, um, it, it seems it, they need to fail once before they listen to you. But yeah, <laughs> we probably have time to wait for them. Is there a document maybe published by the Linux Foundation where there are some numbers given, like the risk of being hit by a security that are your I'm not, uh, the, the question was if there's some um, paper or statistics on how much impact those vulnerabilities have. Uh, there probably is, but I don't have any handy, so um, I, I don't, no, probably not by the Linux Foundation, but there is definitely uh, research on how much these are security vulnerabilities cost. I haven't any ready, sorry. Yeah. Um, so the question was how to handle um, yeah, legal requirements for certification, where, um, for example, in, in the medical space or automotive, the uh, certification authorities are, yeah, they're not accustomed to having software change. Because in the years back, you brought some microcontroller uh, system to control something and you tested it and you released it, it was not connected to anything, and if it worked once, it will work for 10 years. So the process is adapted to testing one version, releasing it, and not changing. So the getting changes certified is very, very expensive. And yeah, I don't think that model is going to work anymore. So basically, the only recommendation there is talk to those certification authorities and convince them that we need to have some process to update the software. We need to do it reliably, obviously, but 
we cannot stay on the old version where we know it's broken and or where we know it will be broken in five years. So that's maybe it's better to the letter of the uh, uh, certification authority, but in practice it's not much better. So something there needs to change in the certification. That's not solved. Yeah, the, the, the comment was that maybe we want to uh, minimize the change. I don't think that that's correct because when we minimize change, we actually move away from all the testing that is happening in the community. And we do some custom changes which nobody else is testing, so the risk is much higher that we introduce problems that nobody else will see and fix for us. So I think the, the focus must be much more on keeping the uh, difference between our version that is released on the product minimal compared to a maintained upstream version. Because we, we can expect that problems in the upstream version are found and fixed, at least critical ones, quickly. And then we need to audit the changes we've done. Um, there, there's some project going on at uh, OSRDL, the Open Source Automation Development Lab, for certifying uh, Linux for ASIL. Um, they are developing a process to get that through certification authorities that might be interesting to look at for, for those use cases. But it's not solved yet, so obviously. How much time I've left? Yeah, I think that is probably, uh, do, we, do we have still time? Yeah. Uh, could you speak up? Yeah, so the question was, what's my estima estimate for basically just rebasing my patches onto the newest Linux kernel, or also submitting some of the work upstream? Um, yeah, that depends on the amount of changes you have. So if you have done a lot of work initially and maybe just have 10, 20, 40 patches left, which are not too difficult, then you can do some additional main learning in, in those two to four weeks. If you have a lot of compli complicated patches, you will spend that time um, for what porting those alone. So there, there, there's no general answer to that. Yeah. Um, I have some suggestions for further talks, uh, which will happen here. Um, the slides are online, so um, you can check them or make a picture or something. Um, those basically talk about related stuff, updating, continuous integration, updating your kernel, and so on, which is all things you will need to do if you want to do it that way. Yeah. Thank you very much.